welcome to the Stroke Recovery Group. I'm so glad you're here. everyone, welcome back to the Stroke Recovery Group from I Care For Your Brain and the Foundation of First Health. I hope you have been with me for our first two sessions where we've gone over the first two rules of rehab. Today we're gonna to move into rule number three. But before we do that, I wanna recap rule number two to make sure that you got all the important information that I wanted you to get. Rule number two was called build on what's familiar. And based on that second session, I hope that you were inspired to bring more of you into your recovery. I invited you to try to personalize your therapies, personalize the way you get motivated to do your therapies, and personalize the way you reward yourself after your therapies. Research is really clear on this. The more personalized your therapies are, the more empowered you're gonna be, the more motivated you're gonna be, and this is going to lead to better outcomes. We also talked about that the essence of recovery is rebuilding your personal brain networks. And we talked about that the brain is organized into large, multifaceted, interconnected layers of brain cells that are unique to you and based on your specific life experiences to date. I encourage you to build on what was familiar. The recovery process of any post-stroke deficit is done by building on what is familiar to you and systematically rebuilding across all the components of a skill or a function. Remember, a stroke damages a specific part of your brain network, and recovery in some ways is as straightforward as rebuilding it. Your job in recovery is to slowly, and with the help of experts in different specific areas, to understand the architecture of your unique brain and to rebuild your networks. And I taught you that you are the glue. Your specific life up until you had your stroke is the very best adhesive we know of to recover these precious brain networks. Works. Now we're gonna talk about rule number three, and this involves repetition and consistency. And this is because repetition is the number one driver of success during recovery because it's the fuel that activates neuroplasticity. Consistent repetition is most important when you are recovering any post-stroke ability. Scientific studies tell us that when enough repetition is done over time, there are long-term significant improvements in the connections between brain cells. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Repetition is absolutely the fuel of neuroplasticity. But it's not just enough to repeat, repeat, repeat. You also have to do this consistently. We really wanna encourage you not to be hot and cold with your recovery. You really need to build in a schedule of rehab activities and exercises that you are going to stick with. Without consistency of practice, unfortunately, it's very easy to backslide and you can lose some of the progress that you've gained. So I wanna use the example of hand or arm recovery to make this point. There are many different reasons why people have trouble in moving a hand or an arm after stroke. But no matter what the reason, consistent high repetition is the most proven way to recover movement and sensation no matter how long it's been since you had your stroke. Neuroplasticity happens when a given task is done over and over again and on a schedule. And what we want you to understand is that things need to be made progressively more difficult as you go into your recovery so that we really get the most neuroplasticity response that we can get. Animal studies have taught us a lot about stroke and stroke recovery, and this was part of that literature that I surveyed to come up with the 10 rules of rehab. What the animal research tells us is that you need between 400 and 600 repetitions before we can start to return the hand-brain connections. Now, that does sound like a lot, but when we think about how that could actually put into a schedule, it's gonna be a lot less overwhelming, I promise. I want you to focus your attention step by step on getting the recovery back in your hand or your arm. 
Hand recovery, arm recovery does not happen from no sensation or no movement all the way back up to full use of that hand or limb overnight. It really happens in a very slow stepwise progression. One of the first things you might notice as you're getting your hand back is that sensation comes back before function. And oftentimes this sensation can be a little bit unpleasant in the form of pins and needles. Once those sensations return, you can know that you are on your way to getting function back, but it doesn't happen overnight. So when we look at an MRI study in which stroke survivors had arm weakness and they were put into an MRI scanner, the brain scan showed that different parts of the brain that had been completely silent before the rehab exercises were able to become activated but only when many, many repetitions were done. So this shows that with massed practice, and what we mean by that is many, 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 many repetitions over time, we are able to regrow these connections between the hand and the brain. I think you're gonna be a little surprised though when you look at this literature and see how many rehab exercises had to be done to get the function back. What they did is they asked them to move their right index finger over and over again. So how many movements did it take in order for folks to get function back of that right index finger? Six to 7,000 little movements with their right index finger. So this was 60 minute sessions every day for 20 days. I bet that is a lot more than you imagined it might take. Six to 7,000. Yes, that sounds like a lot. What we're gonna talk about next is the example of aphasia. Some of you who had a left middle cerebral artery stroke might be struggling with aphasia. There are many different types of aphasia. This is difficulty with language or with speaking. What you can see on my little cartoon I have here is that we have two primary language centers in the brain. We have Broca's area and we have Wernicke's area. In Broca's area, which is a little bit more towards the front part of our brain, this is really the center of our ability to to say our words, to get it out, expressive speech. We then have a little connector that takes us across to Wernicke's area, and that's where we are able to take in language, what we call receptive speech. This is more to do with comprehension. So people can have many different types of aphasia. You can have trouble with just speaking. You can have trouble with understanding. Or unfortunately, with global aphasia, you can have difficulty with both parts. We know from the research on aphasia that higher intensity therapies, more frequency, more repetitions will result in better language recovery. There was a study in 2014 that used pictures to try to encourage people to name the objects that were in the pictures. And what they showed is that people had to do many, many, many repetitions in order to get this function better than it was before. So how many repetitions do you think it took? Well, in this one, what we know was that it took 400 exposures to different cards during the session. And the improvements only happened after doing this for about three hours. So this is a very important part of this rule. It is not about the time you spend during your therapies, it's about the actual number of tries. So we could have two different people who both engage in a one hour therapy session. And it's not the hour that's going to dictate the recovery, right? It's the number of times the person actually goes through the therapy exercises. So there was a study in 2011 that found that during a 30 minute therapy session, one person actually just did three repetitions and another person person did 397. So it really doesn't matter how long we are in therapy. What really matters is what we do in that block of time. So I want you to concentrate on the number of repetitions rather than the length of time. But here's where things get concerning. And this is why I'm so happy you're a part of this group, because you need information that is going to prompt you to really be the leader in this stroke recovery. Because when we rely on the insurance-based rehabilitation system in current medical care, we're not getting enough repetition. So I want you to look at my slide here and you can see that most stroke therapy sessions only have about 40 to 60 repetitions per session. And what did you just learn? It takes many, many, many more times this amount of repetition to actually get function back. So thank goodness in 2020, we are really seeing rehab directors and neuroscientists who are involved with rehab really push for something that we call masked practice. And what this means is that we need to update 
how we design outpatient rehab and inform it with what we know about the neuroscience of recovery. And really the most important thing to get out of this rule is that you are going to need many, many, many more repetitions than you are allowed to have with your insurance-based recovery. Now, I think this brings up a really interesting question, which is, is this why so many of us still hold on to this false belief that we have recovery plateaus after about three months and that overall stroke recovery really only lasts about a year. I think it's kind of an interesting coincidence that most outpatient rehabs actually last about three months. They give you about 10 to 15 sessions. If we just go with that model, what I'm concerned about and really why we wrote the interactive stroke recovery book that this group is based on is if you don't know this information yourself, you really might have a more limited outcome than you deserve if you're able to self-direct these recommendations that we have in this group. So one form of masked practice that has been established for quite some time that I want you to know about is called constraint-induced movement therapy. And what I like about this intervention is it's actually pretty lo-fi and you can completely do it by yourself in your own home. So this is the most common form of masked practice for recovery of arm function. And what you do is you take your unaffected limb and you constrain it. So you take your good arm and you put it in a, a sling or some kind of a, a way of, of holding it so you can't use it. And then all you have to use all day, 90% of your day, you just have to use your affected arm or limb. Now, of course, that is extremely difficult if it's clenched up, if you don't have much function. But the idea is this use it or lose it mentality. So we know that this is a very successful intervention and that it improves the limb's availability um, to engage in daily activities, that it can really help with the quality, the quantity, and the precision of movement. So what constraint-induced movement therapy is? Is, is for 90% of waking hours, five times per week for four weeks, we will see significant motor recovery. And the idea is that it's repetition. It's doing something over and over and over again and not having an alternative that you can fall back on. So you are forcing repetition, repetition, repetition. So now that I've told you how much work is going to be required, I think a great question based on your new knowledge that enriched environments are what is really going to get you better. And remember, that's that really nice interplay and combination between intensive, focused, repetitive activity with very high quality rest is what am I gonna do, Dr. Sullivan, after all this repetition? Well, what brain scientists know is that what you do immediately after all these repetitions is almost as important as the actual training itself. If you don't take a time of respite after you do an intensive therapy, you're not going to be able to absorb and integrate all of that really important input that you've just given your brain. So some people are gonna love this next one. You have permission to nap, to rest after you do an intensive therapy, but I don't want it to be too long. What I would encourage is just a short rest, anywhere from six minutes all the way up to an hour. And what we know is that when we're resting, specifically when we are sleeping, we are consolidating learning. We have known this from some important studies that were done at MIT in Boston as of almost 20, 25 years ago. When we sleep, we are replaying our daily activities over and over again. And it's really a trial and error process to help us figure out what was the most efficient way, what were the lessons that needed to be learned, so we can really get all of that information kind of folded into one specific category that we can use for learning in the future. So the best results happen after a full night's sleep of eight straight hours of deep sleep. When we are in that deep, continuous sleep, like I said, we are replaying the day's events and we are in full learning mode. Another thing that you can do after an intense therapy session is to simply breathe. We do not value deep breathing enough. So many of us are high chest breathers. And one of the things that you want to prioritize when you are in a brain recovery is the rebuilding of your central nervous system. And deep diaphragmatic breathing is an excellent, free, portable, no risk, 
intervention that you can do that will help you do that. So diaphragmatic breathing we know is very effective in calming the brain, calming the nervous system. It will really help you reap all of the rewards of your hard work. It's very helpful in getting a good communication going between your physical self, your brain's cognitive abilities, and the emotional parts of yourself. We know that it reduces anxiety when people are in rehab for stroke. We know that it actually improves motor function. A lot of research has been done on trunk stability, which is very important for getting your gait back, for being able to walk as smoothly and confidently as you did before your stroke. And we know that it also really improves respiratory muscles and exercise capacity. Now this is very important because it really depends on how long you were in the hospital for your stroke, but even just a few days of being on full bed rest can result in pretty significant loss of muscle and overall deconditioning. And a lot of times that results in people having shortened ability to participate in their exercises and in their rehab. So we know that our capacity to participate in rehab is better when people engage in diaphragmatic breathing. So how is diaphragmatic breathing different from just regular breathing? Well, again, like I said before, many times, especially when we're stressed, we can become chest breathers, high breathers. And what we do with diaphragmatic breathing is we really try to focus on bringing the breath in and very long, deep breaths all the way down to the belly. So I wanna teach you this very specific technique that comes from Andrew Weil in New York called the 478 technique. And so this is an idea for after an intensive rehab session. You can get yourself in any kind of comfortable position. You can lay down, you can be in bed, you can be on a chair. And what you want to do is you want to put one hand on your chest and your other hand on your belly if you can. You might need someone's help to get those hands in place. You can also have a loved one use their hands on top of your body because what we're going to do is use those hands as feedback to make sure we're doing the exercises correctly. So what you want to do is breathe in through the nose for four seconds. You want to hold onto the breath for seven seconds. And then when you blow out the breath, what I want you to do is purse your lips and I want you to make kind of a whooshing sound as it comes out of your mouth for about eight seconds. So you're gonna try to increase your ability to do this over time. The first time you try it, it might not be possible to hold all of those beats of so four, seven, and eight. But science tells us that that specific ratio of bringing in the breath, holding onto the breath, and pushing it out is extremely calming and extremely invigorating. And again, we always have to remember that the goal in this stroke recovery is to work hard, but also rest just as hard. I also want you to celebrate all levels of victory after you do your rehab exercises. It's very important that you attune your mindset to noticing the small improvements when they happen. If you don't do this, what I'm worried about is that you are going to get discouraged. And discouragement is really a poison in stroke recovery. It can make us feel like, why bother? It can kill our motivation. And so we really want to understand that bricklayer, baby steps mentality towards stroke recovery. Like I've told you before, it's not often that we get a big, improvement overnight, right? We're really thinking like that bricklayer metaphor I taught you before, and we're realizing that stroke recovery happens in small steps. And we wanna notice when those small steps happen because then we get that positive reinforcement and we know we have proof, we have evidence that all this hard work that you're gonna put in is going to result in reward. And you are, in fact, making progress. So what would be a bad idea after a rehab exercise of something to do? Well, I really want you to avoid stress. I want you to avoid anxiety a lack of emotional support. These are things that have all shown a negative effect on brain recovery. So it's not only the repetition and the consistency of what you do, I also want you to take that rest period just as serious and be very intentional with it and put that in as much of a schedule as you do the more active exercises. But what if all of this sounds great, but it's not realistic for you because you just don't have the physical or the mental energy to do the amount of repetition that you now know is really required in order to get better. 
This is called neurofatigue, and I know a lot of you are living with this. It's the most common post-stroke symptom, and we think up to 85% of stroke survivors are gonna have to deal with this. Up to 40% of you tell researchers that fatigue is your worst or one of your worst symptoms. Neurofatigue is not something that's readily understood, I don't think, by people who haven't lived through it. This is not feeling tired, feeling a little bit down, and taking a nap and being able to perk back up. My patients have helped me understand that this is an intense form of exhaustion, physical or mental. And it's not something um, that feels like uh, taking a power nap is going to help. It is a multi-dimensional uh, experience that involves body, involves thoughts, and involves emotions. Intense fatigue also very naturally causes irritability and very easily can lead into depression. Neurofatigue is a barrier towards your stroke recovery, and so we wanna take it serious and we wanna learn as much as we can about it. When people experience neurofatigue, they have trouble getting back to life. They have trouble going back to work. They can have trouble returning to driving, returning to our social roles, being involved in our community, with our family, and it really can reduce quality of life. In this context though, what I'm concerned about is that the neurofatigue could reduce your ability to participate in an intense enough rehab program to get you the very best results. And it really is a threat to having the best recovery attitude because you might have the intellectual desire to do all of these exercises, but if you just don't feel like you have the physical energy or the mental energy, it is going to be very, very hard for you. So I wanna demystify this part of your experience. So there's three main reasons that we think neurofatigue occurs. The first one is that your immune system right now is absolutely working overtime to help heal your brain at the cellular level. Unfortunately, when we have brain cell death, there is a lot of remnants that are left behind and the immune system job is to get in there and break it all up and clear it out. That takes energy and focus from your immune system. Number two is you're spending a lot more energy doing things right now than you did before your stroke because before your stroke, your brain was seamlessly interconnected and things information flow was great now after the stroke what you're going to struggle with is it takes more time to do the things that you used to do before and more time often requires more energy number three is that you are processing emotional trauma after your stroke again you're going to hear me say this in our time together that this stroke is not just a neurological trauma, it is also an emotional trauma for many of you. So let's go into these a little bit more in detail. Your immune system is really working overtime to heal this brain at the cellular level. So when you are asleep, your immune system can really focus on its job of clearing out the debris from the stroke. This is why whenever you've been really sick in life, you've had a flu, um, you know, you've had food poisoning, all you want to do is sleep. And that is your smart immune system wanting to just do its main job and focus on getting all of that stuff out. When we're awake, the immune system is distracted because because now it has to work on fighting against all of the germs and the different things that we come face to face with. When we sleep, the immune system can work most efficiently. The body and the spirit are hardwired to get back to homeostasis. The brain is painfully aware that something is wrong, something has happened, and its goal is recovery, that it is, is exactly what it wants to do. It really wants to get us back to our baseline, and our immune system is our very best fighter in this journey. So going more specific into what the immune system is doing during deep sleep and rest is scavenger cells called microglia are attacking the damaged areas of the brain to remove all of those foreign particles and to clear away that debris that's been left by the stroke. And stem cells are called in to help grow new cells. And this is what we want to encourage. This is neuroplasticity. So I want you to look at this little microglia and I want you to see that little uh, cellular debris there on the bottom in brain and you can see that its job is to basically send out all of its little tendrils, all of its little arms, 
break down those pieces of debris and then carry them away from the brain. This is a process that is probably happening to you right now, even years after you've had a stroke, particularly if your stroke involved any type of bleeding. You are spending more energy right now doing things than you did before your stroke. Everyday activities are taking a lot more energy from you, and so it's natural that you're going to get more tired more quickly. The third reason that oftentimes people find themselves extremely tired after a stroke is that part of sleep, one of the functions of sleep, is that it helps us to process emotional trauma. Again, I don't assume anything about your specific stroke journey, but what I know from my patients is that many people do find it to be an emotionally traumatic experience. One of the functions of sleep is to review the emotionally laden stressful things that have happened to us during the day, really during the last few weeks and to go over them, kind of like turning over the rock over and over again, so you can see it from all different angles, so you can learn the lesson. And really it's emotional processing to help you come to terms with what has happened. So in that way, I really want you to think about good quality sleep as free therapy. The function is really to try to help your brain understand how this one pretty significant event like a stroke fits into the rest of your life story. Your brain wants an integrated narrative about you and your life and how you're functioning. And when a trauma happens, it takes a lot of brain power to incorporate that into our life story. Who is at risk for developing neurofatigue? Well, we know that if you live alone, you're more likely to get it. Um, the more physically disabled you are by your stroke, the more hard work your immune system uh, has to do to try to get you back to where you were. If you had any depression before your stroke, this is more likely if you've developed post-stroke depression, which is something we're gonna talk about in a future session, neurofatigue can really be a part of that. Of course, that's a bit of a chicken or an egg because what came first, the fatigue or the depression? It is depressing when you don't feel like you can function uh, at a normal level of energy when just taking a shower exhausts you. The more physically deconditioned that you have become after your stroke, again, being in the hospital for a long time, the more likely you are to feel very low in energy. Sleep disorders can be a big contributor to this. You may have had a sleep disorder like restless leg syndrome or sleep apnea prior to your stroke, but sleep disorders can often happen quite commonly in people after stroke. One of our rules is going to be prioritizing sleep, and I'm gonna teach you all about the importance of sleep, how to work up sleep disorders, how to figure out if maybe sleep issues are a part of your neuro fatigue. And unfortunately, if you've had more than one stroke, multiple strokes, um, these folks are at much higher risk for developing neurofatigue. How long does neurofatigue last? Well, for people who have it, it seems to start very, very early. And in fact, most people in the first few weeks after their stroke will tell you that they are bone tired, very, very exhausted. It seems to decrease in most people over the first three months, but unfortunately, the level of fatigue seems to remain pretty steady in most people who have it for at least two years. Now, I know that can be an overwhelming statistic to hear, um, but you have to remember these are groups of people who just had a natural course on their recovery, meaning they didn't have a doctor identifying their neuro fatigue and they didn't necessarily know what to do about it. That's not going to be you now that you're here with us in the stroke recovery group. Unfortunately, up to 30% of stroke survivors still report significant fatigue even after six years after they have their stroke. Multiple medical conditions can worsen neuro fatigue, and I want you to know about them because we want you to identify any issues you might be having and to treat them. The problem with these medical conditions is that they can really add an extra layer of fatigue on top of the neuro fatigue that you might just have from your stroke. So the first one are medications. Unfortunately, many of you have to take medications uh, because of the stroke. Sometimes people are at risk for having things like seizures after a stroke and you have to go on new medications. Some of these medications can make you feel very tired, things like anti-seizure meds, pain medications, uh, sedatives. If you have significant anxiety, sometimes you have to take medications to help calm you enough so you can get through your day and do your rehab exercises. A lot of these medications have the side effect of drowsiness or fatigue. So I would like you to talk
talk with your doctor about that. Please tell them that you're struggling with fatigue. It's difficult to get through the day without having to do a lot of resting and make sure that these medications are optimized as best they can be. Things like vitamin D and B12 deficiencies make people feel tired. Many of us have a vitamin D deficiency. It's the most common vitamin deficiency in the world. Please be proactive about getting these levels tested and advocate for supplementation if it looks like you're low. Next one is diabetes. When blood sugars run very low, especially people can feel completely wiped out. Even when the numbers are running quite high, you can get a big dip in energy after the number comes back to normal. So anytime your diabetes is poorly controlled and your numbers go up and down, that could really be contributing to your fatigue. The next one is any kind of a cardiac issue. I'm thinking here of things like congestive heart failure. It can really make it hard to breathe properly. Things like COPD, pulmonary issues. Anytime we have issues getting a nice full lung full of breath into us, we can have a decrease in oxygen called hypoxia. And if our cells in our body are not getting enough oxygen, we're not going to have the fuel we need to move, move around. Thyroid issues. Uh, many people have hypothyroidism and are unaware of it. We're very clear now that even subclinical low levels of thyroid hormone can really contribute to fatigue. So please have that panel of tests done and work with your doctor to make sure your thyroid hormone is optimized. Anemia, low iron. Iron is one of the things that brings red blood cells into all of the cells in our body, and it really can give us the energy that we need to get through the day. If your iron levels are low, you're going to feel tired. Next one is sleep apnea, particularly untreated sleep apnea. One of the questions we ask our patients if we're worried they might have sleep apnea is do you feel tired when you wake up in the morning? After seven, eight hours of sleep, you really should wake up feeling refreshed and better than you did before you went to sleep. If this is not the case, you very well may have a sleep disorder. Sleep apnea is the most common type of sleep disorder. And what happens is you stop breathing multiple times throughout the night. And when that happens, your oxygen levels completely plummet. And remember what I've taught you about brain cells, they cannot hold on to their fuel. What they want is a very steady supply of oxygen. So when we have these big dips, we're going to get subtle, mild levels of brain damage over time. And when brain cells and body cells are not fully healthy and vibrant, we are going to get a decrease in our physical energy. We wanna take stress serious when we're talking about fatigue because many of us manage our stress by holding onto it, developing this kind of armor in our muscles and we can become very, very tense and we sometimes don't even realize it. And that tension holding onto those muscles so tight can actually take a lot of physical energy. And when we're using our physical energy for just standing perfectly straight and making sure that we're prepared for anything that might come and we're bracing ourselves for the next stressful thing and how the rug's going to be torn out from underneath us, again, we're subverting a lot of our precious energy into just survival. The next one is things like depression and anxiety. When we are always tense, when we're anxious, when we are sad, when we have grief and we are not properly expressing it, we hold it in the body. There's an excellent book called The Body Keeps the Score all about this. What we don't process verbally in terms of our life stressors gets held onto by the body. Again, muscle tension, uh, which can dramatically increase fatigue. And the last one again goes back to that deconditioning, just having a loss of stamina, a loss of muscle strength. A lot of times this results in not breathing properly and we can only have a very small amount of energy to get through the day. You can even use that up with something as simple as getting in the shower. So we wanna go through all of these um, exacerbators of neurofatigue and make sure that we're taking those serious. So what helps? If neurofatigue is such a big problem, what are the protocols for managing it? Well, unfortunately, we really don't have at this time evidence-based guidelines that doctors and therapists can turn to to know exactly what it is we're supposed to do to either evaluate or treat post-stroke fatigue. 
Survivor and family education and counseling has been identified as the most important rehabilitation intervention for the management of fatigue. And why I like that so much is because it's really in line with my philosophy in being here with you for the stroke recovery group. It's that education is empowering, education is healing. If we don't talk to people about why they're having their symptoms, it becomes an even bigger problem. And now it's mysterious and it feels out of control and we don't know what to do about it. So isn't it interesting that these education programs are really what have been shown to help people? And what's incorporated in these is teaching people how to recognize what it is that fatigues them. How is it that we can help people better be physically engaged? be able to actually relax, how to teach people how to calm their nervous system by themselves, how to teach people something like activity pacing. If before your stroke, you were a very active person, you did things on your own, you were very independent, it can be very difficult without being taught how to understand how to do life different, that you can't get it all done in the same amount of time that you did before, and that you might have to delegate, and you might have to take rest breaks. These are things that can be taught to people. The concern that a lot of us have is that we're not doing that, and folks then don't know how to manage their fatigue. So all of these things really help people to have a sense of control over the fatigue. And I think that that can be a big theme in stroke recovery, is that this thing has happened to us that makes us feel like our bodies are out of control with the stroke. And then when additional things happen, like this huge wave of fatigue, it can also feel traumatic and that it's yet another thing that's happening to me that I can't understand. So I'm a big believer in education, simply helping people understand why they're having that symptom. Because there's so many different causes for fatigue after a stroke, uh, and that these causes can be really interrelated with one exacerbating the other, what we really recommend is a combination of techniques. So these are the very best things that I know to encourage you to do to combat neurofatigue. And this is a long list, so you can look at this on your own later and go through these. What the research tells us the most helpful thing you can do is consistent low intensity exercise. So what I mean here is you don't have to get a trainer and go to the gym every day. That would be ideal, and if you're capable of doing that, good for you. But low intensity exercise is really effective in combating fatigue. So even something as simple as couch exercise. If you are on the couch watching your favorite show, every time the commercials come on, as much as you can, you can march in place, you can lift up your arms over your head, you can shrug your shoulders back, you can move your head from side to side. We simply want you to encourage circulation and more oxygen movement throughout your body. And again, remember I said that word consistency because it's not enough to do it. We really want you to be on a regular schedule with doing it. The next one is prioritizing sleep. It is not enough to have little bits and pieces of sleep throughout the day. We don't want you sleeping a lot during the day. We really want you in a normal sleep-wake cycle that when the sun goes down, your body starts to produce more melatonin and you get into that nice relaxation and you have long, uninterrupted periods of sleep. When the sun is up and that melatonin goes down and your cortisol goes up, we want you to be focused, alert, and engaged. This sounds like a very simple thing, but I know for many of you with stroke, that sleep-wake cycle gets all fouled up. And that's why one of our rules is about prioritizing sleep, because we really need a full session together to talk about that in detail. We also know that this pacing of activities that I just mentioned is very, very helpful. So what this means is actually scheduling short blocks of time where you focus on the thing that is most important to you. We then want you to have a scheduled period of time while you rest. We want you to be comfortable in delegating tasks to other people that might not be your favorite thing to do, might be something that really drains your energy from you. That is often very much easier said than done, and it can be very difficult to ask people for help if you're used to being a really independent person before. We also wanna encourage you to prioritize nutrition. It is really as simple as moving away from highly processed foods 
over to whole foods as much as you possibly can. Again, in a future session, we're gonna revisit this in more detail, but I'd love for you to really try to uh, eat as much organic food as you possibly can, moving away from things in boxes over to things that are actually fresh and in eating them in as much of their natural state as possible. I want you to prioritize hydration even just being a little bit dehydrated really, really affects our physical and our mental energy. So in addition to drinking all that water, we all know we should be drinking, you can also really prioritize this by eating foods that are very high in water content. Things like cucumbers are very, very watery and really help that good water get into our cells and things like watermelon. It's very important to me that you take your mood serious. And again, we're gonna talk about this in a lot more detail in the future, but things like high stress, the trauma of everything you've been through, the depression that can so easily creep in after a stroke, all of these things can really zap our energy, especially if we are engaging in the classic coping mechanism that we all too often do, which is avoidance. We try to push it away. We don't wanna think about it. We don't wanna remember it. Well, when you push something stressful out of your conscious awareness, where do we think it goes? Well, oftentimes it goes from the forefront of our mind push down into our body and how our body reacts to all of those unwanted thoughts and memories is to get very tense. And like I said before, when we get very tense, we spend a lot of energy holding our muscles in those unnatural positions. And it's kind of amazing how much energy that can actually take from you. We want you to motivate and energize yourself with things like music and pets. We want to bring in things that inspire you and make you feel energetic and that you wanna participate in daily events. You can also get very strategic about how you use caffeine. Caffeine is a part of many of our lives between coffee and, and tea and soda, but we wanna make sure you use it smart and at the right time of day. A great time to have a glass of uh, green tea or a cup of coffee is really first thing in the morning when you get up so you can get motivated. You don't wanna use it later in the day, say after three o'clock, because that can really interrupt that sleep-wake cycle that we want you so badly to be back on a stable footing with. It's also really important that we avoid significant alcohol after a stroke. Now, I am not here to tell you how to make your personal decisions, and I, I certainly think for many people there can be a role for a little bit of alcohol in your recovery, not too much. And if you've had a stroke that affects your balance or your uh, dizziness at all, might not be the best idea, but you definitely want to avoid drinking more than one drink a day or one drink a few days of the week because of its effect on the sleep-wake schedule. It can maybe make you feel good in the moment, but what we know is in those hours after you have a drink, you can kind of take a dip down and feel very tired, feel like you need rest, but then when you rest, your sleep is actually quite broken up and fragmented, and we don't want that. We want you to have nice long periods of consolidated sleep. The next one is hard, uh, but it is necessary, and this is adjusting your expectations. When you have neuro fatigue, you are not going to have a day like people who do not have neuro fatigue. It can be exhausting to just get out of bed, have your breakfast, and get in the shower. And when we fight against that by holding on to our old expectations, it makes it even harder. So we need to remember that stroke recovery takes time, it's a journey. Um, we really want to educate the people who are around us that we aren't just being lazy, that we aren't interested in our recovery, but that we literally have a post-stroke symptom called neurofatigue that is very real. Some people treat their neuro fatigue with a stimulant, and I wanted to include this because I've seen people have very good results with this, but not a lot of people know that it's an option. What a stimulant is, it's a wakefulness promoting medicine, and you might think of it as a treatment for something like attention deficit disorder, but it really does have a role for some people in brain recovery. The most research that has been done on a stimulant is for a medicine called modafinil. And this is a neuroendocrine regulator that stimulates pathways in the brain that actually have neuroprotective properties. So we think that it might also promote neuroplasticity, which is a wonderful benefit, but it also really helps people feel more mentally alert. So that way they have more mental energy to focus in their day. So the research studies that I think are of the best quality have looked at 200 milligrams of modafinil. 
And a lot of these people report a significant decrease in fatigue and along with that comes an improvement in quality of life. Unfortunately, there are some people who are not good candidates for stimulants. That's folks who have things like glaucoma, any type of cardiovascular disease. So if you've had a heart attack, sometimes the docs don't think that's a good idea. Uh, hyperthyroidism, high blood pressure that's poorly controlled, or a history of drug abuse, somebody that unfortunately is prone to overdoing it with medications. It's a great conversation to have with, with with your doctors and it's something that I know has helped quite a few people. I want you to take your fatigue serious, especially if it is getting in the way of your ability to do your rehab exercises, if it keeps you from being social in a way that's satisfying to you, or if it makes you significantly less able to do the things that you value and enjoy in life. And so you can talk with your doctor about it, Make sure they understand how serious it is. Sometimes people who don't have this condition think of it like normal fatigue and you know the idea is just take a nap. Neurofatigue is really, really beyond that. Now that you know this information that I've taught you in rule three, your job is to think about how you can apply it to your recovery in your everyday life. So I'm gonna leave you with the question of what are you going to choose? Let's finish up with our self-empowerment statement for rule number three, and this is, I value the roles of both hard work and rest in my ongoing recovery. Yes, you have to work very hard, but you also have to rest very hard. Remember, in some ways, what we're talking about in these 10 sessions is really as simple as that, providing you with that enriched environment that we know promotes neuroplasticity. I hope you guys come back and are with me for rule number four. This one's gonna be pretty fun. We're gonna talk about how to harness your creative power, how to use your creativity and the power of your thoughts to enhance your recovery. Thank you so much for being with me and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.